Hello and welcome everybody to the next session in our two-day webinar, The Power of Ecosystems. My name is Raymond Hoffman. I'm a founding member of the Business Ecosystem Alliance and I'll be your moderator for this session. The Business Ecosystem Alliance is co-founded by Thinkers50 and the uh, Higher Model Research Institute. The Alliance will create forums for the sharing of knowledge and experience on the subject of ecosystems and it is based on the founding belief that ecosystems are an important and growing phenomena in the life of organizations in all sectors of activity. This session is titled Designing a Winning Ecosystems. Uh, Designing a Winning Ecosystem. And for that, we have two of the world leading authorities with us today, Michael Jacobides and Alessandro Di Fiore. Michael Jacobides is a professor at the London Business School, where he teaches entrepreneurship, innovation, and strategy. He's also an academic advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, visiting scholar at the New York Fed and the visiting fellow at Cambridge. He's a Thinkers 50 ranked thinker, works with the world's leading consultancies and advises startups as well as Fortune 500 firms across the globe. Alessandro Di Fiore is the founder and CEO of the European Center for Strategic Innovation, ECSI, and also of ECSI Consulting, with offices in Boston and Milan. Alessandro was included in the Thinkers 50 radar and is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review. He's also the author of a number of Harvard Business School cases and his articles are published worldwide in publications such as the London School of Economics Review or the Rotman Ma Management Magazine. ECSI Consulting aims to provide a bridge between the latest academic management research and the practicing business world. To this end, ECSI maintains thinking partnerships with a number of leading academics, including Michael Jacobides. So before we get started, a very brief outlook for the session. In our session, we'll first hear from each of our speakers with some opening remarks for about 10 to 15 minutes. We'll then move on to conversation and Q&A, including audience questions. So please do use the chat and Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time. Michael will lead us off with some remarks on the need for an overall game plan and how to think about ecosystems from a strategic perspective. Then Alessandro will, in true ECSI fashion, take over and build a bridge to business practice and show us how to make the magic happen. First, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start sharing my screen um, as I'd like to uh, help guide part of our conversation. Um, and uh, I'd like to help us think from what we should be doing in the world of ecosystems. So, Perhaps a bit of background is going to be useful in terms of what do we mean with the term? Because, of course, there is a lot of ambiguity uh, and a lot of excitement, uh, and the term is just now starting to be defined. So what do we mean by ecosystems? Well, ecosystems are, in essence, if you think about it at the level of the entire corporation, uh, consist of two complementary but rather distinct things. The first thing is an ecosystem of multiple products and services that are bundled together in order to give uh, to the final user something of value. Think about what big tech is doing. Think about Apple that bundles search and music and videos and internet browsing and camera pictures and messaging and so on and so forth. Now, this is the multi-product ecosystem. It defines all the things that go together uh, that make the customer happy, whether it is a retail customer or a business customer. There's another type of ecosystem, and that is the multi-actor ecosystem. If you think about Apple, for instance, Apple doesn't write all of its software, but it has an ecosystem of co-specialized participants, that is the multi-actor ecosystem where they all bundle together, and Apple organizes, orchestrates, sets the tone, tells them how they will connect not as a buyer, it gives them autonomy, they control the revenues, but they are complementary to it. Now, what you see happening is firms, as they try to move in more and more of these areas, why? Because they want to give something that is of value to the final customer, rely more and more in multi-party ecosystems, because you can't do everything yourself. So the multi-firm and multi-party ecosystems are too connected but distinct features and organizations are broadening their scope, but also increasing their collaboration as they seek to uh, leverage the relationships outside. You can see that in big tech, in addition to 
Apple, Google is doing it, Facebook is doing it, and you now see big tech increasingly competing as each one is trying to expand its scope and each one is bidding for other players to collaborate with it. But it isn't just big tech that is doing it. You see that in the most traditional sectors. Let me take one example. We worked with a CEO of that firm together with Alessandro um, just a year ago. NL and NLX, the traditional utility, uh, the former monopoly of Italy that has branched out not only in uh, renewables and all of that fun stuff internationally, but also is starting to use its points of contact to build ecosystems. So let me give you one example here. What does it have? It's got 3 million lampposts. Why are they important? Well, because that's the way that you connect to the public authorities. Why does that matter? Well, because this is a big part of the expense. But now they're saying, why do I just give lighting? Why do I think about expanding what I do, moving in architectural lighting and urban advertising and electric buildings and adaptive lighting and the rest of it, and think about a broader suite of services and think about myself as a B to P to V, business to politician to vote to a company that wants to ensure that I give the right kind of package that will excite my direct and indirect um, uh, clients and as I do so, perhaps start thinking about the way that I bridge other people, not only expand the value proposition, but connect with other participants who will together allow me to add value to the customer. So if you think about it at the level of the company, there's a lot to do because it's an exciting area with many choices. And while the word is um, interesting, I think that it comes down to a significant amount of hard work. Sure, ecosystem means that you need to be adaptive, you need to be responsive. It doesn't mean that you just stick a spaghetti on the wall and you see whether it stays there and you're like, ha, ah, we were lucky this time. You need to start organizing yourself and putting things together. And now I'm sharing um, a framework that I developed in Evolution Limited, where I'm the lead academic advisor, where we worked in seeing how ecosystems uh, are structured and helping influence the way that we think about these ecosystems, we realize that it consists of seven steps. And I'm going to give you the overall picture uh, and let Alessandro drill down in the details of one of them in a complementary, if different, tool that is the ecosystem canvas. So at the level of the four firm overall, the first thing you need to do is to say, ha, huh, how can I change my scope? Can I think about where in this package of the different things that I can put together will I work? And that's a key issue that many companies do wrong. What does the landscape look like from the perspective of my firm? Because quite often you have firms focusing in themselves. They're focusing on their ecosystem rather than the ecosystem, and they don't map out the options that participants have. So the first couple of steps in this framework help you think about what is the appropriate scope, what are the alternatives that the customers have, and as such, what are the different things that you should be participating in. And then, that's why we have this different cycle, you need to dive in and look into the specifics, business by business, to think about, okay, well, in order to provide all this offering, I will need to also find some of these participants. I need to design multi-actor um, ecosystems or perhaps participate in the multi-actor ecosystems. And for each one of them, we recommend that you need to do a step to a set of steps to figure it out. You've got to understand in each of these multi-actor ecosystems, what is the role that you're going to play? What is the ecosystem value proposition and how you can enhance it? How do you think about partnering, whether you are running it or you want to uh, be involved in that? How do you attract partners if you want to be the one orchestrating? Or do you, how do you make yourself more attractive to partners if you're not? And then think about implementation, issues such as governance. How do you set it or how do you try to influence it? And finally, what is the high level case for investment once you've seen it? What benefits do you expect? Because if by your initial sketch, they're not there, you need to go back to the drawing board. So after you do it once or twice, that allows you to figure that out. What's fun as you do that is you realize that there are a number of options you have. And what this tool does is it helps us understand what are these options. For instance, when you compete in ecosystems, sometimes you're the first one. You're creating something that didn't exist before. Sometimes you think about the 
competitive dynamics when it's head on, when you've got Android taking on app or iOS. Sometimes you see an ecosystem forming by helping to unbundle an existing one. Think about Craig's Pages and how Craig's Pages used to be this integrated entity that then got broken up by companies that looked at the particular part like Tinder and Reddit and Zillow and Airbnb. And another strategy is to envelop. Think about what these mega apps are doing from Grab to WeChat to Walmart and others that are trying to create the same strategy. Each of these approaches has a different uh, term. And also, you need to understand whether you're speaking about an, uh, an ecosystem that is global, a few like the big tech ours, but many, many of them are either multinational, like the ones operating in, in some parts in the EU, national or often multi-local. If I'm a, a company that cares about matching uh, about buyers and sellers, quite often we care about the specific cities whereby the matching happens. So you need to start arming yourself with the analytics that will allow you to understand it. And you need to make some recent choices. One of the key choices you need to make is the choice of whether for each of these multi-actor ecosystems, these little uh, verticals that we saw, you're going to be the orchestrator, who meet, which means that you're going to be at the center of it, you're going to be the hub, creating lots of spoke, whether you're going to be a partner, uh, which means that you're going to work with, but not going to be independent, or whether you're going to be a complementer, because this is the risk-reward profile, and crucially, the investment profile that makes sense. This is another area of significant confusion, because most companies say, oh, great ecosystem, I just want to run the whole thing. It doesn't work like that. And I think that we're going to see a lot of misplaced investment for people who have simply not done their homework. Next, you have to see the ecosystem. How can I make it exciting? How can I not simply say I can make it work, but combine the selection of the market with the selection of my strategy? And the, to motivate the example here, and I know that we have many people coming from China, consider the growth of Pinduoduo. And Pinduoduo was able to uh, grow because it didn't simply say, I'm going to be an alternative to JD.com or Alibaba. It identified a specific uh, demographic, people who enjoy video games and enjoy gamification, and it turned shopping into a gamified and social experience. It was able to create and craft a value proposition that made sense. Then you have to ask questions of, how do you engage partners? And you can engage partners with financial or fin non-financial rewards, thinking about the end user or thinking about the channel. And you need to start building your panoply of choices. And you have to ask yourself, what am I in there for? If I think about me and ecosystems, am I after increase of customers, after cross-sell, after uh, leveraging the data, and that helps you understand the benefits. And then you look at the cost increase and the investments required, and you're like, net, net, what do I get? And if it stacks up, great. If not, you try again, and you refine your strategy because it's an iterative process. But also, it is a process that requires for you to do your homework. And um, if you want, you can download the paper from the Evolution Limited uh, um, Net site. And I guess that my takeaway there and thinking about it in working with organizations is that there's a lot we can do in a structured way in order for us to understand our business environment better. For each of these seven steps I mentioned, the scope of play, the competitive landscape, i.e. the competitive ecosystem landscape, the role of the firm in the multi-party ecosystem, the nature of its value proposition, uh, the nature of partnering, the implementation dynamics, and the case for investment. There's a lot of thought that needs to go in it. Quite often, you hear people say, oh, it was just lucky. But well, we can't just tell you to be lucky. We need to tell you to think about how you can create value, doing your homework, and applying yourself. And I know that I'm going to leave you in capable hands because Alessandro is going to shift away from uh, what I mentioned now, which is the high level view, the basic choices, the corporate scope, the definition of what we need to have concluded in order to be successful and move into something which is more akin to one of these ventures. Um, and you can use a tool that uh, is an additional and complementary tool to what you saw 
uh, via consistent canvas. So um, uh, look forward to the Q&A and Alessandro, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, Michael, and thank you for the bridge into what I'm going to present here. So let me share the screen quickly here for the benefit of the audience. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, a very simple tool, which is uh, the um, ecosystem canvas. So you probably are all familiar with the business model canvas. And uh, we designed and developed an ecosystem canvas uh, where in uh, one page, in a single page, we want to summarize uh, all the key elements of uh, designing an ecosystem strategy. So if you think about the overall uh, process, uh, which has been described by Michael, uh, so here we are focusing on the Value, prop value proposition and the partnership model. So on the steps uh, three, four, and five, which have been described uh, in the uh, overall flow of uh, Michael. So let me, uh, let me go through uh, this uh, one page and then I will present uh, one example where this uh, one page canvas is uh, fulfilled and is a good summary of an ecosystem, ecosystem strategy of a bank in Singapore. So if you start from the top, think about this as a, a strategy for an incumbent company. So I'm an existing company, I'm not a startup. Uh, so that's uh, the view we are taking here. So I'm starting from a core offering. What is the core offering I'm starting from? And the example of a Michael on NLX, what was the core offering they started then to create an ecosystem around the starting anchor and core offering? That was public lighting. Uh, so the lighting poles that you see in the street, which is obviously nothing new, nothing novel, nothing innovative, but around the anchor, the core offering, they created an ecosystem strategy. So the first question for an incumbent company, which is the core offering and anchor, I want to start from, and usually related to that, there is a digital platform. The reason why ecosystem have been spreading in the last 10 years is because of the digital trend and digital adoption and digital technologies that makes all those interconnections much easier and much more effective in terms of a cost and an investment. Then if you go down, the uh, shared functionality is uh, the job is uh, to think about something which is not too narrow, because if you define a value proposition which is too narrow, you end up with a value proposition for your products, your core offering, instead of thinking about holistically what could be the value for something which is broader, which is including the complementers, which is including a potential other partners in the offering to the end users and to the customers. So that's a step one. The step two is about complementers. So which are the other products and services which should be part of the portfolio available for the users and the customers of the ecosystem? Before jumping into names of a potential partners, we do recommend that you think about what is the category of products and services which are actually very nice to be complemented to my anchor or to my existing core offering starting from. Think about the case of NLX, which was presented by Michael. The anchor was the public lighting, and then they started to think about what I can add. Is it something about urban architecture? Is it something about urban advertising? Is it something about eBus? Is it something about security, which is added to the lighting, the public lighting, and then is used by the uh, city town or eventually used uh, by the citizens in the, in the city. Then you move to the fir firm's role, which has been described by Michael. The firm's role is uh, you, you want to be an orchestrator or you want to be a partner or eventually simple contributor. Probably if you are a simple contributor, you don't need to go through this uh, uh, heavy exercise of really thinking strategically about the different uh, components of the canvas. But if you are an orchestrator, or if you want to be a partner, you really need to think about uh, what is uh, eventually your shared functionality, your complementers, your architecture, et cetera. But no, it's very, very important that you clarify between orchestrator 
and partner because of the ambition, the scope, there are a number of implications on your strategy design. The other element below the firm's role is the ecosystem architecture. Is this a two-sided um, is a two-sided platform or ecosystem, or is it three-sided? No, or who are uh, fundamentally different partners? Who is on the user side? Who are the users and the customers? Who is on the partner's side, so on the supply side? So you really need to think about the architecture, not only who are the participants and identify clearly the participants, but also how those participants are going to match and how are going to interact and exchange whatever is the unit of a value which is exchanged on the ecosystem. Then you move on the right and there is the partnering model. The partnering model is about, again, now you can identify the names. If you are in a B2B, what are the potential partners and are you keeping the partnering model completely open or is it semi-open so you're going to actually filter and make a curation and keeping strategic control. And which are the terms of a participation? So is a standard agreement or you have a custom made agreement or you have a taxonomy of agreements according to the category of a potential partners. And the last one under partnering model is the customer relationship model. You think about most of the times you have a digital platform. So which are the touch points? Which are the information flow and the data you want to capture and use it to improve fundamentally the value that you are delivering to your users and customers over the ecosystem? You need to engineer all the different touch points and the info and customer relationship model in a way that you are able to play with data and using the data to improve the benefits and the value generated for the users and the customers of the ecosystem. If, uh, if you go at the bottom, uh, there is a value sharing model. So if you are, for example, the orchestrator, uh, how are you going to share the value among the different participants? And if you are an incumbent, usually the incumbent is coming from a culture and the DNA of control, vertically controlling the supply chain and the value chain. So they tend to appropriate all the value or most of the value which is possible on the table. This doesn't work in the ecosystem economy. So you need to think about what is the fair split of the value created by the ecosystem between the different partners, between the different participants and the users and the customers. Now, let's go to the uh, one example here. Uh, so if you see uh, here, we are in Singapore and uh, we are um, in, a banking, uh, in the banking industry. Uh, and I will show you first the commercial, an advertising spot. And after the commercial and the advertising spot of a DBS, which is a, is a very innovative bank in Singapore, we can use the canvas to summarize what we have seen in the commercial in one page. Gotta do it right. Don't ask daddy. You don't have to. Don't ask mommy. Put my money on a stamp. I like to save it. She likes to save it. He likes to save it. We like to save it. So you saw this is uh, the commercial, so the advertising uh, uh, spot for uh, DBS. Uh, you can uh, now, if we go on the ecosystem canvas here, what you have seen is uh, the 
description of an ecosystem uh, through advertising. So if you think about, this is a banking, we are in Singapore, DBS is the bank, the core offering, if you go to the top, the core offering they are starting from is I want to sell as a bank, saving accounts, those are a joint saving accounts, parents and students, to enable the monitoring of uh, you know, the kids and uh, to enable the monitoring of the money transfer or the money which is used by the kids. The digital platform is an app, is a smart body that you have seen uh, during the commercial. So it's a very simple uh, application uh, which can be downloaded or is downloaded actually both from the parents and the students and the parents have those uh, monitoring uh, features and functionalities and the students they can use uh, the app uh, together with a smart watch which is one of the complementers to pay and um, a number of different services. So what's the share functionality? If you go on the left, so it's not, if you define the share functionality very narrow, you go back to your old traditional business. I'm trying to sell a saving account. I am a bank, I'm trying to sell saving accounts. If you broaden up your share functionality or your value proposition, you start to create something which is a potentially interesting also for complementers and partners. So in this case, they define the shared functionality as a remote monitoring of a student's consumption, the behaviors, the movements, and also the health status. So it's, it's about remote monitoring. It's not about selling a saving account. It's something more holistic, and it's something that will not be possible for DBS to deliver on their value proposition standalone. So as a consequence, because it's a broader and more holistic, I need to include other complementers. And the, which are the complementers? There is obviously a commercial partnership and the complementer, which is the smartwatch. They don't have a smartwatch. They are not a hard or consumer electronics. So they found a partner and the smartwatch together with the smart body app is fundamentally enabling the ability for the students to pay and is also enabling them the ability for the parents to track the spending and also gamify uh, you know, in a way that we are influencing positive habits on, uh, on, on, the, on the kids and on the children. Then who are the other complementers? Are the schools, for example, the canteen, you can pay uh, at the school's canteen. Are the merchants payments, which are part of the uh, network, so they enroll the number of merchant payments where the students uh, using the smartwatch and the app, they can pay um, electronically. Uh, and then uh, now relatively new, at the end of 2019, also they added uh, the government, so public transportation. So I can pay the tickets of the buses, and I can pay the tickets of the underground uh, using, for example, my smart habit. So obviously in this case, the role is the orchestrator for DBS it was pretty clear. They wanted to create and they created this ecosystem. And what is the architecture? You can see that you have the customers, you have two groups of customers, the parents and the students with the different needs. And on the other side, you have the supply. The supply are the merchants, the schools, and the most recently also the government and particularly the public transportation of the government. Uh, talking about one year ago, they enrolled about 32% of government schools in Singapore and more than 10,000 merchants in, in Singapore. So if you think about the partnering model, if you go on the right, uh, for the merchants, it's a little bit like a MasterCard or Amex. They use commercial standard agreement. But when you do the agreements with the government and schools, they are custom made. So they are... Uh, uh, individual contractual agreement. And then, and then they mapped all the touch points of the customer relationship model, and all the touch points were digitally supported by the smart uh, uh, body app and by the platform. And obviously, they are using the data to understand the habits. And based on the habits, they can add the functionality and features that they develop a, a better digital platform. But also, they can decide more holistically which are new complementers that they can add the value in the future. So that's, a, uh, that's an example in action of uh, the 
um, over the canvas. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see the monetization model. The monetization model is very fair in trying to split the model and the value which is uh, created uh, between the schools, the merchants, uh, and also DBS. So DBS is not playing uh, the vertical integrated uh, DNA uh, uh, and is trying to be fair in splitting their value. So I'll stop here um, and uh, now thanks to the audience and I will stop here and uh, give you back uh, Raymond for the Q&A session. Thank you both for uh, very insightful presentations that should certainly give us enough food for uh, an equally, at least equally insightful conversation. Now. Um, and I just, you know, encourage our audience again to sort of keep those questions coming in the chat uh, or or in the Q and A. Um, as a starting question, maybe maybe first uh, one for for Michael, uh, from myself. Um, what, in your experience, is typically the starting point or the trigger when firms begin to think about ecosystems? What creates the kind of first thought? I mean. Surely, or maybe more specifically, when is an ecosystem a valid strategic consideration in the first place? I mean, it's surely not a catch-all for every single business problem you may have, right? I think that this is uh, sadly rather traditional, um, and it is a combination of greed and fear. Uh, and I think that uh, the fear comes primarily from looking at your lunch being eaten by companies that move outside and greed because you want to be part of it. But slightly more seriously, I think that what is happening is that we're seeing the boundaries of sectors that are increasingly being um, just, they, they vanish and ecosystems, especially this idea that you've got these multi-party ecosystems that provide a new value proposition um, is something that uh, suggests that you need to move outside your immediate market. Companies see that because they see their margins starting to erode, and they also see that because they see other firms that are starting to be massively more uh, attractive. And they're like, well, what can we do? So the uh, I think that much of this desire that uh, emerges, uh, emerges by an effort to see how you can redress the potential decline. The other thing that happens is that people seize opportunities. And this is a very different group of firms. And they are the firms that say, hey, that gives us the possibility of finding a new way in terms of growing. And that's this interesting dynamic going on. You have some new firms that are building ecosystems. And these are more often than not firms that are much more digitally fluent, but more importantly, strategically fluent. What do I mean by that? They are the firms that are not hindered by their existing legacy and the like. We'll see what configuration makes sense for the customer. And if we work really hard and we create a good design, that will allow us to grow. That is what has allowed take financial services. Some companies like, you know, even if you bypass Stripe, think about Square, that has managed to become such a big challenger to the traditional payment uh, uh, firms by offering bundles of services to the companies that it works with and combining some basic CRM and uh, some merchant support, uh, but starting with a really good understanding of the customer. So I think that uh, it depends on where you're coming from. I think that there are almost customer insight and customer opportunity-driven ecosystem moves. And then there are defensive moves of those that say, shoot, the world is changing. What can I do? Um, I think that the, you, you're going to see some differences in what triggers each. But the both, to me, are equally interesting. And they require a little bit of closer care and attention to ensure that the original insight comes to a successful outcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, and you mentioned, I think, uh, a, a key point, which is, you know, customer value. Um, and we have uh, one question coming in um, from, uh, from Richard. He's also referring to some of the um, uh, previous presentations where there was a lot of talk about value propositions. And uh, I know, Michael, you're also very careful with defining your terms. And Richard's particular question is, 
Um, there have been multiple de definitions circling around. So how would we define value proposition in, a, in an ecosystem world? Maybe either, you, either of you can try and answer that. I'd rather let Alexandro take that. Yeah, I have confused, but I no. was just astounding, Alexandro. Okay. You know, yeah, I can, I, can, I can take this one. So it's, uh, you, you probably saw uh, that in the ecosystem canvas, we use the word shared functionality. And uh, in uh, the sub definition is a job uh, to be done. Now, uh, is um, I think one important uh, mistake to avoid, uh, I mentioned briefly, is uh, to define the value proposition or share functionality of the ecosystem too narrow. So if you take the DBS case, uh, no, it could be something about uh, just the saving account. So I'm a bank, I'm defining a, a share functionality about my core product only or very narrow. Uh, like uh, related to the saving account. So that case is not something that uh, I'm going to have enough uh, holistic uh, uh, share functionality to involve or to be attractive also for the complementary. Mm -hmm. So in chemicals, I was mentioning another case because this is a real case in agricultural chemicals. So think about a chemical company selling fertilizer and, uh, and selling uh, crop protection products. And they were defining initially the value proposition or share functionality for the ecosystem too narrow, like uh, uh, something like, you know, I'm uh, uh, thinking about the crop protection uh, of your needs as a farmer, you know? And if you think about only crop protection, so it's protecting your crop from anything can happen in terms of uh, disease or in terms of uh, Fungis or whatever, uh, obviously you are defining it too narrow. And then at the end, we did an exercise of uh, broadening up, uh, mapping the pain points along the overall holistic uh, experience cycle of a farmer, independently from the touch point of selling only my product, which is fertilizer, crop protection, insecticides. And when uh, they mapped the overall holistic uh, experience cycle of a farmer, they realize that at the end, what the farmer is looking for is maximizing the yield of a crop, reducing the risk, because there are so many risks which are not controllable, which are not just the climate, but no, it can be a disease. There are so many risks. I'm spraying the wrong insecticides in terms of frequency. So there are so many risks that can happen. And you are fundamentally chopping a full year, because you know, the crop can be full year or a semester if in, in, in case uh, you have a semester crop, right? And, and so the, they restated the share functionality as I'm going to maximize your yield, reducing and controlling your risk about doing business. And when you immediately redefine the share functionality in this way, you see that as a chemical company, I am not enough. I'm going to address the real critical pain point and goal of the farmer, but no, my products are only a teeny part. So I need to think about an insurance company, which is covering the risk. I need to think about how to maximize the yield that also depends on agronomic data. For example, real-time weather data or disease data or any type of, of data about uh, you know, increasing the yield I need to think about agronomic services, for example. So you immediately are broadening up to complementers because your share functionality is now is holistic and anchor to the critical goal and pain point of your end user and customer, in this case, the farmer. How to avoid the mistake of being too narrow is one of the critical success factors. Well, let me complement that because I think that that ties in quite nicely with the emphasis that tends to exist in both the literature and sometimes uh, in, in uh, some of the consulting workshops that I see in jobs to be done. I think jobs to be done is a misleading uh, way of thinking of it. The reason is that um, uh, the challenge here is problems to be solved. And one of the sources of success is when your problem to be solved uh, was before too narrow and, and it was defined in the job to be done. 
So think about what Alessandro was just saying about this example. The job to be done was, I know I'm going to be using this fertilizer to uh, increase the crop. It's like, well, no, this is a part of what you're doing because you've got a broader problem that you can solve. And I think that ecosystems are uh, fundamentally successful when they provide you with this, aha, hey, I can find another problem that can be solved and come to think of it, this means I don't need to focus on the narrow stuff that might not be terribly um, um, efficient in terms of, of what I get. Because people don't come, and I think that ecosystems don't work when you simply have someone say, ah, let me tell you a new way to solve your existing problems. They invent new needs. I mean, you know, in this world of consumerism that we live, needs are not given, they are invented. Who the heck would know that your need would revolve around um, funneling your insecurity through social media. Well, that is one way that you can solve your problem of socialization. So I'm not always saying that ecosystems are good, by the way. I think that uh, the problems to be solved uh, can be problems that are genuine and that can be problems that you know leverage our psychology, which is exactly why now regulators are starting to take a long, hard look, especially for some of these big tech firms saying, is this problem that you're solving a real one? And are you abusing the people you're solving? But that happens for a very small number of firms. In any way, the value proposition to me is uh, the ability that exists at the level of the ecosystem, this bundle of services and products that you offer to solve a problem that was either imperfectly solved or not addressed at all. And I think that it is the innovation uh, that allows you to understand, you know, how you improve um, uh, how you're going to be addressing the needs of the customer. And you include these new functionalities, like the ones that Alessandro presented us, that are giving part of the value add. Yes, yeah, I think that's, that's a perfect segue to some sort of one of the bigger questions that uh, Steffi also is asking uh, in, the, um, uh, in the chat, you know, from the audience. And her question is, it's directed at the canvas, but probably it applies to a broader sort of ecosystem uh, world as well. And she says, you know, can we also use that to solve value chain issues? As an example, cradle to cradle issues of plastics from producer to user and then recycling. So the kind of circular economy thing is, is ecosystem thinking the right way to sort of approach that? I think, I think that not only is it the right way, I think that it is very hard to do it because precisely what we have been doing is that we have focused on an overly fragmented fashion. Now that though requires a solid design of ecosystems. And to some extent, it's like ecosystem gives us, give us new arms. What are we gonna do with them? Are we gonna kill each other or rather allow some firms to only create their dominance? Or are we going to also marshal them to support um, you know, the public good? When we started understanding how to build better organizations, Better organizations were created both for good and not for good. And I think that this is uh, one of the challenges we get. But I think that ecosystems give us tools that we did not have. Let me give you one example um, of a venture I've been involved in um, uh, called Velocia. What does Velocia do? Velocia is part of these uh, ventures that are involved in the mobility space. But what Velocia wants to do is rather than saying, I'm going to be the umpteenth final mile company, it says that I'm going to be working with some local communities in order to be able to reduce the total emissions. So it works now with the city of Miami-Dade, and Miami-Dade says, okay, we're going to create a token that is called Velocia, and this token um, is going to um, allow us uh, to reward the people that engage in the right behavior. So for instance, you go and you ride with someone at work and you can be rewarded with that. And you can use it in order to rent a bike for free or use the public concert for free. So you are starting to use this as part of a gamification that allows people to change the behavior in a way that is friendly to the environment. The cool thing about ecosystem is that it can create engagement and it does not need to be only motivated by pecuniary benefit. Well, let me give you another example of another venture which is going to be crowdfunding, I think, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this venture is called My Local Token. 
What these guys do is that, look, one of the big problems that we see, especially with e-commerce, is the fact that urban centers are starting to be decimated. And a number of us are concerned about that because we feel that they offer the social fabric that allows communities to you know, understand each other and us need being able to rely on proximity that makes us more human, uh, COVID notwithstanding. So what my local token does is that it works with uh, local communities and says, I will create a token that can only be used within a local community and that will be accepted by the shops that uh, sell local content. So you can now create a tool whereby you can have things and it's connected with another venture called Trapes that is creating these gamified tours that you look around the city and then when you find that stuff, it gives you these tokens then the tokens enter the local economy. And as they enter the local economy, they support the shops that have local products, that are not part of chains. They create things that we have pre-selected, and as such, they address the goals that we set. So the way that you can design ecosystems is up to you. And what I'm now seeing with companies like my local token and Trapes, both of which are not just for profit, is that you see organizations that are taking the energy of their founders and want to achieve a collective goal that goes beyond profit. At the same time, we have the concern, and you know, I'm, I also now have a regulator hat as the chief digital expert in one of the EU competition authorities, that big tech firms are abusing their role in ecosystems. So you've got both. I think you've got opportunities and you've got challenges. You've got opportunities because you can embed these social objectives if you are uh, careful about putting them in the design, and you've got challenges in terms of the way they're going to work. But I think they're going to be an important part of the solution to a number of these uh, systemic issues that we find. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think that would be probably a good point to switch to to one of the other questions, and maybe we can combine a few of them, or actually two of them I'm, I'm having in mind that are coming in. Um, the one is from Corina, who asks, uh, how can you ensure collaboration within the ecosystem? Some companies might be egocentric, too competitive, and so on. And maybe that combines nicely with uh, Mina, I hope I pronounced that even remotely correctly, question about how do you run your, your ecosystem model as an orchestrator, how do you run that profitably? Um, and that per perhaps all in the context of some rather critical comments I see in the chat as well about uh, value creation, yes, but for whom actually? Right, so do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, yeah. So there are three different three different questions. So let me take, a, let me take the first one is, uh, so you're designing an ecosystem, you think about the complementers, you think about the partnering uh, model. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, very different if you are in a B2C situation like uh, Apple Store or in a B2B situation. If you are in a B2C situation, it's, uh, no, it's a volunteer. Do you want to develop an app for the Apple Store? Is uh, your judgment, uh, your evaluation as a developer, if I want to do the investment because there is a potential market or value I can capture being in the Apple store, obviously because Apple developed an ecosystem, there are so many users of the uh, Apple store and uh, in general, uh, the Apple ecosystem with the iPhone, I'm entering in that ecosystem because I know that there is a customer base and there is a user base I can potentially tap and they do their own strategic consideration of the whole business case consideration. So it's, uh, is it really is not by invitation, it's not by discussion with the partners, but not the uh, supplier of uh, apps uh, is making uh, their own entrepreneur call and judgment if I want to join or not based on investment and based on expected return on investment on an established ecosystem. If you are in a B2B, uh, I want to go back to the um, chemicals, uh, the agrochemicals company. And uh, no, I'm going to invite uh, a number of insurance companies who can actually offer into my ecosystem risk protection products. And um, 
And at that point, there are a number of conversations and you can discuss with uh, you know, different insurance companies and maybe some of them, uh, they don't see the value because they have a DNA and culture, which is very much of a strategic control. And they uh, see this more like a risk than an opportunity, or they don't find a way to uh, split value in a nice and a fair way. And some other insurance companies, they will be happy to jump on. So it is not very different in that case, if you are in the B2B, on having conversations with the potential partners and funding a number of partners who wants to support the initiative, who wants to join the strategy and contribute to the strategy of ecosystem creation. And probably, you know, if you are in the industry, you know immediately that I don't want to go to those three companies because those three companies have always been very obsessed with the strategic control and they do everything at home. So I don't even waste the time of calling a meeting or calling an initial meeting. So this is what happened in B2B from an orchestrator standpoint, like the agrochemical company. I don't want to have only one single insurance company offering one product, I want to broaden up the basket. So ideally offer multiple uh, options to my customer, which insurance product. So I want to invite a decent number of uh, complementers and partners and, uh, and treat all uh, then at the end in the same way. So naturally the agreement and the split of a value should be standard across this side of the supply side. But no, those are conversations. I think that's my experience. I don't know, Michael, if you have a different experience. Well, I, mean, I think that the question is a very important one. And the question is important because it also highlights the limit of all the excitement with platforms as opposed to ecosystems. Platforms are the things that allow the technology that underpins many of these connections. And I think there has been a techno naivete uh, and also the assumption that the platform business model is applicable everywhere. Rubbish. That's an idea that is going to lose you money. Ecosystems are about business design. It's about creating and designing alignment. A moment ago, we said that ecosystem can even decide what the collective objective is, and it could not only be offer stuff that makes us be more profitable, but creates some, uh, help solve some of the systemic issues that we're faced with. And I think that it really comes down to, and that's why, you know, when I was presenting the framework, I said, well, we really need to understand what are the objectives and how do you, uh, are you able to create alignment and make sure that it all comes together? Because it is fundamentally about business design. There are a few cases where there are some extremely powerful um, uh, gatekeepers that basically had that partly because they were attractive like Apple or they were early and they locked people in and everyone wanted to join like Facebook. And we think the world looks like that. It doesn't. You need to think carefully about how you can align uh, the participants. And I think the architecture of alignment, which is what the models that you see, is what it is all about. So, you know, I saw a comment a moment ago, um, unlearn B-School. Eh, rethink B-School perhaps? I think that the problem is that uh, we don't have a developed set of tools about that. Not that, you know, we're going to say, oh, this is a world where people just do whatever they comes to their mind. Creativity is a necessary component for you to come to a solution. And I think that what we are right now working on, those of us involved in trying to push thinking an ecosystem is, and how can you sort out the difference between what works and what doesn't? And I think that that will require some retooling. So in that sense, I agree with the fact that you need to retool what you uh, teach in a business school, but it requires you to focus on the question of how do you create alignment and how do you leverage the possibilities that we have seen, which have been driven by technology that allows us to recombine things in ways that were entirely impossible to do before. But that is the beginning. Technology allow and modularization allows you to reconfigure. And now that we said, oh boy, we can create all that stuff. Now we've got the exciting job of putting it together. And I think that the putting it together is why this conversation in the Business Ecosystem Alliance and others is going to help us hopefully push the needle a bit further. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think you, you're giving sort of almost like 
holding up the keyword for, for our next and final audience question that we, if we hurry, actually can sneak in. And it's from Andre, and he talks about a necessary move from 20th to 21st century management, sort of to run your own organizations. And you, Michael, you just referred to the kind of need to sort of change your thinking about, you know, how you think about many things and how does that translate into how you run your organization internally as a successful player in an ecosystem world? What would you argue are some of the main differences in skills necessary? Well, maybe, Michael, I'll give you my two cents here, and uh, you, you can add. Uh, I think I want to, there are many, so I want to point on uh, a single barrier or a challenge. So if you are a large incumbent company and you come from a century of uh, competitive uh, strategy and where all is about uh, controlling resources, uh, strategic uh, control, and uh, eventually commanding your value chain. Think about the automotive. And Michael has been doing some fantastic research on the automotive industry. And think about the automotive where the automaker is actually creating a value chain with the first tier, second tier, and they are commanding their value chain. So if you have that DNA, if you have that culture, if you have those management practices, which have been the ones used for a century, or years and years, is very difficult to move uh, to an ability and culture and mindset and the strategic orientation of orchestrator or partner on, on ecosystem. So that's, uh, I mean, that's the main challenge we see in incumbents. They want to do it. They understand the fear in case of a defensive move, or they understand the potential value in case of a greed using a Michael words, but then when they get to the actual design and execution, uh, the capability gap is immense. So how do you uh, how do you bridge that gap from a capability and culture standpoint? Is one of the key struggling questions or barriers for companies, and there are models or ways I take this out of the company, you know, or I. You, Hire new people uh, with uh, uh, from a different industry. Uh, no, Michael, we we have seen all those moves, you know, all, uh, all, all of them. Yeah? All the time. Let me try okay. to to summarize it uh, quite quickly. I think that the shift here is the shift from uh, abusing your partners and abusing your customers to creating value for your partners and creating value for your customers. Uh, traditional industry boundaries that did not move allowed you to have an, uh, the ability of being much more abusive. And if you had one eye in the land of the blind, you were doing okay, actually you're doing rather well, and you'd work with your chums. This is not working anymore. And uh, what clearly that requires a significant change in order for you to adapt. And we see that for new ventures, we'd see that for existing companies, uh, clearly, that doesn't mean that any crazy idea works. And that's why I guess that uh, the emphasis recently that uh, a number of us have tried to say is beyond the metaphor, beyond the idea, what can you do in order to have some discipline and help understand uh, rhyme and reason as you try to find these opportunities for joint value creation? It's not that there are no rules to the game. It's just that it's a different game. Thank you, Michael. Um, there couldn't be probably more appropriate closing words. We are out of time. Um, thank you both very, very much. Um, we're at the end of this session. I'd like to thank uh, Michael and, 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 and Alessandro for their insights, all of you for watching, and of course, particularly those of you who are actively, actively participating with asking great questions. Thank you, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much.